site, let's say you finish it, your semester project, and you decide that you want to actually put it on the, on the internet. How do you go ahead and do that? Um, and that brings us to a discussion of web servers. Um, and that topic sort of moves into our next topic, which is a topic of forms. So, uh, and then if we have time, we'll also discuss tables this week as well. So web servers, forms, and tables. Uh, accessibility, I'm pretty sure I wrapped up everything I wanted to talk about that. Uh, the main points that I want to, to give is that uh, this is an important thing. A lot of times web developers don't really focus on this. And uh, I think you do need to pay attention to it. Uh, some of the key points are that things that you do for people with disabilities also are relevant for people that don't have disabilities, that might have some temporary condition, or might uh, um, have a preference, or something along those lines. So for example, one thing that you can do for people that are colorblind is you can offer them the option of uh, picking the color scheme for their website for your website. Now that is beneficial for people that are colorblind to be sure because they can pick the color combination that looks best for them. But it's also beneficial for other people as well. It makes it look nicer, allows them to customize it. And again, even people that aren't colorblind may see better on one particular color scheme than another. So that's sort of a win-win situation. So don't think of doing things for people with disabilities just for people with disabilities. Think of it that it can benefit more than uh, those people. Uh, for people that are deaf, um, you can provide a, a audio track and provide then captions for it, or can provide um, a transcript of it. And again, that will certainly benefit someone that's deaf, but someone that's not deaf um, has the opportunity to choose whether they want to read it or listen to it. So the, the key things about accessibility is number one, keep things simple. All right? um, we talked about certain cognitive disabilities such as, such as ADHD or dyslexia or other things like that uh, or, or epilepsy. Some of those things can be triggered um, when there are, for example, animations that a lot of stuff going on uh, that don't really add anything to the site. So keep it simple. Put stuff on the site only if it adds value to the site and only if it adds value to the page. The other thing is, and it seems in a way contradictory, but multiple presentations. Take the same piece of information and show it a couple different ways. So you have text along with an image. You have an audio clip along with a transcript of it. Now, that doesn't violate the simplicity rule because it's adding a benefit. All right, the transcript adds the benefit of someone that can't hear the audio can read the transcript. So don't add stuff just to add it to your page, just to fill an empty space. Add stuff that's going to add value uh, to your page. Uh, colorblind, if, you, if you're showing, if, if a certain color means something, like warnings are in red, change something else about it as well. For example, make it, make it bold, make it italics. Uh, something like that. Make it a bigger font. Make it a you know, smaller font, I guess. You know? Anything that will cause it to stand out. Um, and those things, two things taken together are uh, what you can do for accessibility. Now, when we talk about forms and tables, we'll talk about some specific things to them. All right. What if you have a website? We created our website about possums, let's say. And, and let's say we want to make that live. Um, what are the steps that we have to go through to do that? All right. So for example, if I have that website on this machine, is it available to people on the internet? No. All right. People can't just access stuff that's on your machine. Um, you need a specific piece of software that's called a web server. All right. So your machine needs to be connected to the internet, and you need to be running a piece of software called a web server. What a web server does is it's a piece of software that listens for requests and then responds to them. And what do I mean by a request? A request is asking for a certain page. So this is a request to Google's web server. If I go in and type www.google.com and press the button, I just made a request to Google server and Google server responded. So there's requests that you make to a server 
responses that you make, that, that you get back from a server. So every website on the internet is, is run through a web server. In other words, there's a computer somewhere that has a piece of software that is listening for requests and responding to it. So if we type in ESPN.com, ESPN's web server is out there somewhere waiting for requests and then it responds to it by providing a web page. If I click a link, I made another request to ESPN and it's responding to it. Rookie rises. Aaron Judge beats the hype with home run derby power show. Exactly. All right. So, we have servers that are out there waiting for it. So, to make your website live, the first thing you need is a web server. And that's a computer that has software that is listening for requests. Now, how does a request make it to the right computer? In other words, if I type in www.google.com, I get a response from Google's web server. How did my request make it to Google's web server? Well, it's kind of like mailing a letter, right? When you mail a letter, you provide an address. All right, you say, um, you know, 1005 Abbey Road North, Elyria, Ohio, 440, whatever the zip code is, 44035. And the letter would make it here to Loring Community College's um, campus. Um, now, Every place, you know, most, I won't say every place, but most places on earth have an address. You know, the, the, a number, a street address, uh, a city, state, and zip. Let's just talk about places in the United States to start. All right, so any building probably has an address that you can give the address and it will make it there. Now, every building also has a latitude and longitude, right? You know, if you look, the latitude, longitude, and you know, and that's another way to say the location of a place. So I could say this building is 1005 Abbey Road North, or I could find its latitude and longitude. What is the latitude and longitude of, of LC's campus? I would be amazed if you, had an, if you knew that, because I have no idea what it is. We could, we could look it up, probably, all right? But that also says exactly where this campus is. Now, there's sort of the same thing in the world of the internet. There is what is called the domain name and there's what's called the IP address. The domain name are things like www.espn.com. All right. So, you know, you could call it the URL of the site. So that's the domain name. The IP address is a number that looks something like this. It's four three-digit numbers. And three-digit numbers go from 0 to 255. So this might be a website somewhere. I don't know. I wouldn't put it in because you're not going to know what you're going to, you know, I have no idea what you're going to get if you put in that IP address. But that could be an IP address of a particular website. This is sort of like the latitude and longitude. Every place on Earth has a latitude and longitude, but humans don't really know latitudes and longitudes because they're really hard to remember. So can you imagine if you had to memorize all these numbers for every website that you wanted to get to? Facebook would have a, four a, 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 a set of uh, four numbers, and Google would have a set of four numbers, and Loring Community would have a set of four numbers, and so on. That would be very difficult to memorize. It's much easier for people to remember the domain name. So every computer on the internet has an IP address. Even you, when you're connected to the internet, you have an IP address. All right? 
But computers that have web servers also have domain names associated with them. And the domain names are simply an easier way to reference uh, a computer on the internet. All right? So, domain name, IP address. How do you get these things? How do you get an IP address? Well, if you're just a user that's accessing the internet and you're not hosting a site, every time you connect to the internet, you get an IP address. All right? If you're a company and you want to put up a website, you provide, you, you, you get this typically through your web hosting company. <laughs> Thank you. So, an example of a web hosting company is GoDaddy, for example. That's like, that's like a famous one. Uh, there's one called Hosting Matters, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. And what they do is they provide computers, and they provide space on those computers. And you can go and, um, you can go and, and register um, and, and pay a certain amount per month, typically. And sometimes there's restrictions about, like, you can only send out a certain amount of data, almost like a cell phone, you know, with a, with a mobile phone that you have, you know, data restrictions that you have so much data per month. Same thing with a web server. It can deliver a certain amount of data per month, and then you might pay extra. But you subscribe to a web hosting company, and that gets you your IP address. The other thing that you have to do is you have to register a domain name. Now, there's only one organization in the world that hands out domain names, all right? But there's companies that will help you through the process of registering it. So, for example, GoDaddy. If you, were to, if you wanted to create a site today and you contacted GoDaddy, they would be able to handle sort of the paperwork for you to register with this company and also provide you the service. Now, the domain names obviously have to be unique, right? Just like the IP addresses are unique, all right? Now, there's a set of computers throughout the internet called domain name servers, or DNSs. And what those do is they take your domain name and transfer it to your IP address, or, or translate it to your IP address. Because the IP address is what really the computers need to talk to each other. The name is just an easier way for humans to remember how to access a site. So, Google has an IP address. You type in Google in your browser, when you connect to the internet, the domain name server will tell you, hey, google.com is such and such as an IP address, and it will direct that request to there. All right? So, if you wanted to create your own website, if you want to take your, the, the Possum website and put it on the web, what you would do is, first of all, get a web hosting company. Register your domain. And what that would do is that would link up on all these DNS computers throughout the company, your domain name with your IP address so that people could type in your address and it would take it to your web server. So this, uh, this web hosting company would have web server software running to, would, that would take the request from people and translate it um, uh, and, and respond to them. All right, now, let's go in and let's actually put this possum site up on the web. So here we go. Here's the site, and it's on our computer. So we can access it. All right, so here's our page about possums. Okay. All right. Now, no one else in the world can access this right now because it's on my computer. So it's not running web server software, and it doesn't have a domain name. It does have an IP address, but because it's not running web server software, 
if you tried to access this, this, this uh, IP address, it wouldn't work and you wouldn't be able to get it. Now, I'm not going to go and register a domain. I already have done that. I have a personal domain, which is MikeZellers.com. All right? And um, it has an IP address and it has a domain name. So I've already done these two steps. Register my domain name and have the hosting company. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transfer the files up to that server. Um, and that can be done a couple different ways. One way is you can use a program called a FTP program. And FTP stands for File, File Transfer Protocol. The other thing that you can do is a lot of times um, web hosting companies provide sort of a control panel for you. Uh, a, a set of tools that, that, that makes it easier for you to transfer files and so on. So, let me go in. And I'm going to access my website. And the way I access it is through MikeZellers.com slash cPanel. cPanel stands for the control panel. Now, I would be the only one that would be able to access this, right? Other people could type this in, but since you don't know my username and password, it wouldn't do you any good. All right. So I go there. It takes me here. It's asking me to log on. Because again, this is going to allow me to put stuff on my website. I don't want other people to put stuff on my website. All right. So I'm going to log in. I hope I remember my password. I did. And now I have all this other, all the stuff that I can do. I can do things like, for example, I can look and see how many visitors I've had. Yeah, looks. So here's different visitors that I've had, and I can analyze that. So I can see, and there's other statistics too that you can see like where people are coming from and, and so on. Um, any errors that were obtained and so on. I'm going to go to this which is file manager and this is what's going to allow me to upload files up to the website. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create a folder on my site called Possum. So I'm going to go and say, create a folder called Possum. Create new folder. All right, there it is. Now I'm going to click Upload to upload files. This is very similar to what you do in Canvas, right? You can click on this and you can upload files to Canvas. Well, you can upload files to the web server, uh, same way. So I'm going to click on Select Files. I'm going to go into this folder and I'm going to upload everything. Actually, I'm going to drag files over there because that will be simpler. So let me go and grab all these files and I'm going to drag them here. And it's going to upload them. There it goes uploading them. Yeah. All right, so they're all uploaded. How would I access this then? Well, it's my domain name. I created a folder called Possum, so I put Possum, and then I would put in the name of one of the pages. And what was one of the pages called? Possum.html. And there you go. There's the page. And there's the page with the picture of the Possum and so on. All right. Now anyone in the world could access it if they knew the address. And what, I, what would I do? I would go and I'd create links to that. 
all right, and, and allow people to access it. Right now, no one could, you know, right now anyone could access it, but they'd have to know the URL to type in. Whereas if I was doing this for real and I, I wanted to have this available to the public, I would put a link to it on my home page and so on, and that way people could access it. All right, so let's, this sort of dovetails nicely into my next topic, and that next topic is the topic of forms. All right, so. There's a diagram I use in a lot of my classes that looks like this. This is how this is sort of how it works, how the client sends a request to the server and gets a response back. So the client sends a request through the internet to the web server, and the server sends a response back. How does the client's request make it to the server? Because the IP address. So they type in a domain name and a URL. The DNS servers that exist on the, in the internet translate that to an IP address. It makes it to the right server. And the server then sends a response back. It's really like sending a letter. It's like sending letters back and forth. All right? In other words, you are mailing a letter. You drop it in the mailbox. Now, how does it get from the mailbox to the, to the, the recipient of it? It might go through a whole bunch of processes. Let's say I was going to send a letter to Colorado. I would drop it in the mailbox, right? Uh, let's say I'm going to send it to Boulder, Colorado. I would drop it in the mailbox in, uh, in Amherst, all right? Um, mail person is going to pick up the mail and take it to the post office. The post office then may send it from Amherst to Cleveland. All right, and so maybe all the letters from this area go to Cleveland first. Then maybe it goes to Denver, and then from Denver maybe it goes to Boulder, and then from Boulder it goes to uh, the house that I've sent it to. Same idea with this. In other words, and that's why it's drawn as a cloud. The request doesn't go directly from the client to the server, but it bounces around on the internet, and it finds its way to the proper server. And in this class, we don't really care how that happens. We just trust that it does happen. And likewise, the response coming back. So the client makes a request to the server and gets a response back. All right? OK. What is that request? The request contains, first of all, a URL. And what is a URL? It's the address of the page that we want. So in this case, the request was mikezellers.com possum slash possum2.html. If I go and type in imdb.com, that is the URL, and it will go there, and so on. However, and, and then the response that the server sends back is just a web page, right? So the request contains a URL, and the response that comes back is a web page. And it's a web page with HTML, images, CSS, all those files that go into a web page come back to the client. Now, that's how it works with the kind of web pages we've been doing so far. But there's other kinds of web pages. And let's see an example of this. Let's go to Google. And let's do a query for men's formal wear. Let's notice a couple things. Where are these things located? Illyria. I don't know where this is, like somewhere by Westlake. Midway Mall, Great Northern Mall, Great Northern Mall. 
and so on. Isn't it interesting that it gave me things like in this area? Let's put in another example. Italian restaurants. We search for Italian restaurants. Notice what it gives us. It gives us Sereno's, which is down the street. Angelina's Pizza, which is somewhere around here. Olive Garden, which is not too far away, and so on. And it gives us the best Illyria restaurants, Nino's North Ridgeville, and so on down the line. Isn't it interesting that it didn't give me any Italian restaurants actually in Italy, all right, or say New York City or Los Angeles or big cities? You'd think that they would have the most famous Italian restaurants, all right. Obviously, this page is customized because I'm making a request here in Elyria, Ohio, all right. So something extra has to be going on here. And that's where the web server comes in. Remember I said the web server takes the files and responds back to the client with the response, which is a web page. Well, there's more going on here, right? First of all, I go to Google and I type in a search term. I could type anything in there. I could type in backpacks, I could type in ACDC, I could type in hair dye, I could type in Lorraine Community College, I could type in anything I can think of and I'm going to get a result just about that topic. All right. Now if you think about it, does the Google web server have a billion different pages, one for everything that someone might possibly type in? No, that wouldn't make sense. Secondly, it's pretty clear that my results depend on the location that I made the search. I search for Italian restaurants. I don't get Italian restaurants in Rome or Naples. I get Italian restaurants in Illyria. That's all. So more is going on here than meets the eye. And that more is these servers can run what are called server-side scripts. And what these are is these are little programs that customize the web page that it's going to send back. Remember, the server sends back a web page to whoever requested it. However, in the case of server-side scripting, that web page is customized depending on a variety of factors. All right? Some of those factors can include what someone has typed into a form. In other words, if I type in Asian restaurants versus Italian restaurants, I'm going to get a whole new list of restaurants. All right. Likewise, if I search in Illyria and someone else searches in New York City, they're going to get a different list from me. So the web server, when it customizes a page, can take into account the location of who is making the request. How does it know the location? Based on the IP address. Based on the IP address, it can tell I'm connected from somewhere in Illyria. It doesn't know precisely where, but it knows that I'm somewhere in Illyria. But also, form data can be used. And the server can use that to customize the response that is sent back to the user. There's other things that come into play too. If you have a Mac versus a PC, it can tell that. So if there's a download for software, it can tell you to download the Mac version or the PC version. All right. So what we're going to study in this section is we are going to study how to create a form to supply data to a web server. All right. Now, we do not study server-side scripting in this class. So we'll not do this part of it, the customization. Right. But we will do the form part of how to take that data and send it to the web server. 
All right? And that's what we're going to start now. And I'm going to use Google's web server to do this. I'm going to write my own page that makes requests to Google's web servers. And this is fine with them. They allow you to do that. You can incorporate Google searches into your page. They, they want you to do that, as a matter of fact. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a page that allows us to write my own page that I can type in something and I can do a search. In other words, I'm going to create a page that's like this page. It has a blank where I can type something in and I'm going to add a button and it will send me to a page. So let's do that now. I'm going to start with the possum page just so I don't have to type some of those tags over and over. Let me rename this to search. And let me delete all this stuff. Okay. First of all, you have a form tag. Think of the form tag as being like the envelope that you're going to send the letter to the server in. In other words, all the stuff that you're going to put to the server is going to be in the form tag. Because in this case, in the case of Google, there's only one thing that we're sending to In the case of Google, there's only one thing that we're sending to the server, right? We're sending the word that we're searching for. Unless, of course, we do an advanced search. where I can pick things that have been updated in the past hour, for example. In which case, I'm sending two things. I'm sending the fact that it's a past hour, and I'm sending them searching for HTML. Or, like, for example, if you go and register for a site, if you go and create an account on Amazon, you'll supply your user ID, your password, uh, your name, your address, um, maybe credit card information and so on. So you might send more than one piece of information to the server, but in this example we're going to start off small and we're just going to send one piece of information to the server and that is the word that we're doing a search for. Now I'm putting a space in here because I'm going to put some things in here. Method equals post. Right. We're going to skip that for now. Just remember that it should say method equals post. Okay. We'll talk about the difference between that in, in a few minutes. But right now, I don't feel like talking about that. So we'll just say method equals post. Okay. Action equals... Action is the name of the server-side script that you're going to send the data to. Now, I can look 
and the name of the server-side script is just this stuff here. Right, just that stuff. So I can type in, whoops. I can type that in there. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that because I have done this sort of thing for a long time. But this is what gets called when you type something in. So if I type in HTML, that's the script that it got submitted to. That's the name of the script that it got submitted to. Now, notice what's after that. I'm going to go and I'm going to paste this into a new document so that we can take a close look at it. Q equals HTML. Well, gee, Q equals HTML. HTML is the type, is the thing that I searched for. That's the term that I searched for. So, it's important to note that that's the web server is expecting the word that we're searching for to be called Q. All right? That's what that means. Q, the thing that we're searching for, equals HTML. Let's put something else in. Let's search for Italian restaurants. Now look what it says. Q equals Italian restaurants. So Q is the name of the thing that we're searching for. The stuff that comes before the Q is the script that's handling this request. So the script that handles the request, you put in as the action. But you're going to remember the names of these fields because you're going to use those in a minute here. All right. Then I have my end form tag at the end. I'm going to say search for. Then I'm going to have an input box. An input box is something that allows the user to type in some information. Type equals text. Well, they're going to type in text, so they can type anything in there. Name equals, what do you suppose the name is going to be here? is going to be the Q. Because Q is what Google calls the thing that you're searching for. How do I know that? I looked at the URL. So name equals Q. All right, that should be enough. Let's go and save this. And run it. All right, search for, I type HTML. Oh, I'm missing something. What am I missing, if you remember back from Google's page? I'm missing a button to go and actually complete the search. So let's go and add that in. Input type equals Submit. That says it's going to be a submit button. Value equals go. So now we have the button there. So if I type in HTML and click go, Whoops. 
I'm going to change my, I'm going to use Bing, because I have had this problem with Google. Um, Bing is another search engine, and I'm just going to substitute them in there. So we're going to do a Bing search instead of a Google search. All right. So Bing search, again, the address is this of the script. Q equals, again, they also use Q. All right. So let's go and try this. So I do a search for HTML, click go, no. and I'll be darned, this is still, still having this problem. Ah. This method should be get, not post. My mistake. I'll bet you Google will work now. Sort of worked. Let's try. Let's try Bing again. There we go, success. We have, a, we have a Bing search from our page. Now again, um, the little stumbles I had, you shouldn't have because in the lab that assignment that, that um, I have, I've given you the URL. Um, so you just need to copy that. Normally, you or someone on your project team makes the URL that is handling the search. So the only reason I was having this difficulty is um, someone else made that URL and I wasn't using it correctly. All right. And again, method is get. Get means it's going to send it as part of the URL. The other option is post, and post sends it a different way, and it doesn't show on the URL. OK. So now. I can send and I can do, with, through my little web page, I can do any kind of Bing search I want to. So I can type in Italian restaurants. When I click go, it's going to take me to this page, which is finally the correct page. It's going to put on the query string, it's going to put on the URL after the question mark. That's what's known as the query string the value of whatever I've typed in that text box. So I type in Italian restaurants, click go. That's what gets sent to the server up here. That is the action, this part here. That's what I put in in the action. Because I've used get instead of post, it puts the value on the query string. The query string is a question mark, everything after the question mark. And it calls this Q because that's what Bing expects the term that you're searching for to, uh, to be. So I call that, I give that a name of Q. All right.
Any questions about this? All right, we're going to do a little bit of styling and, and accessibility for this now. All right. Generally speaking, you can think of a form as being a list of items. And generally speaking, the, the, the list, the order of the list doesn't really matter, so you can think of it as an unordered list. So I'm going to put everything in an unordered list to start out with. All right, so I have this. I save it, and now the page looks like this. Well, I don't know if I like the bulleted points, so let's get rid of them. Now, for this example, I'm going to put my style sheet as part of the web page. So. style Oops. I'll say UL I'm going to say list style type colon none and that's going to get rid of the bullet points All right, easy enough. Now, we only have one item on this form, but many forms could have more than one item, right? When you have a name, an address, a phone number, and so on. Now, this is also an, ex an accessibility issue, right? Because you can see that this box is searched for. How do you know that? Well, because you can see it's right next to it. Remember, though, when, when someone is accessing this through a screen reader, the screen reads it to them, and it's not obvious what goes with what, right? It's obvious to you because you can see, and you know that that label belongs with that. Well, for accessibility reasons, we could put in a label tag that's going to help people that are visually impaired to associate the text with the text box. So I'm going to put a ID on this guy. And I'm going to use the same thing as the name. I'm going to call both of them Q. I usually do that most of the time, simply because that's easier for me to keep track. So, so a text box can have both a name and an ID. They're used for different purposes. The name is what gets sent to the server. The ID is used for other purposes. And I can put a label tag for here. And I'll say for equals Q. Now what does that mean? It means that this label belongs to the thing that has an ID of Q. So that matches up this text with this label. Notice that doesn't have any effect for people that can see. All right, but for people that can't see, that's very beneficial. All right, so that's one thing that we can do for accessibility. Now, we can do more styling if we want to. We could, for example, say,
form border 1px black solid, we could say um, padding 5 pixels margin 0 pixels auto and so on. Let's give it a background color too, background. And the only reason I'm going over this is to show you that everything that we've done for everything else, we can also do with forms, right? So now if we go and look at this, that's what our form looks like. Well, we could even give it a width if we wanted to. Let's make this a little bit lighter gray. Whoops. And we can give it a width of four hundred pixels. All right, so now we have that. Uh, I don't like sort of how these things are on top of each other. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to what do you think I'm going to do? Well, put space between them. How do you put space between things? You do it with a margin. So I'm going to say input. Margin. Bottom. Ten pixels. So I put some space underneath it. I want this centered. All right? I don't want to center this. Let's say I don't want to center this, but I don't want to center this, but I do want to center that. So what I can do is I can say submit. Text align center. Now, pound sign means it has to have an ID of that. So, ID equals submit. I didn't do input because I don't want every input item centered. I just want that one. So, I give an ID for that. And I didn't do anything. I give it a width and an inline block display that should allow me to center that guy. There we go. Sort of makes the width bigger. Um, let's make it 200. I hit 300 again. Thank you. All right, that makes it that big. I don't really want that that big. I can go in and for this one, though, I can say with 50 px. All right, so I'm problem some centering that. I'll be darn. I think I know what I need to do. I shouldn't have put the width on this. I should have put the width on the LI. That will take care of it.
not having good luck today on this. Ally with. All right. I don't know why I'm not getting it to centered. I'm giving up. Yeah, we're ally. Oh, you you might be right. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's say margin zero px auto This is my last attempt, and I'm giving up for good. Okay, let's do it. All right. Guess I'm giving up. Yeah. All right, we'll take this out. Kind of bugs me. If you run into a problem like this, I can work with you to figure out exactly what's wrong. Well, anyhow, there we go. Right. All right, it's styled. And it's more accessible, too, now. All right, because it, um, it um, has a label tag which associates for people that can't see that, that those two things are, are visually uh, next to each other uh, for us to do this, HTML. All right, and we can do the search. All right, let's review this, because I kind of got hung up on, on that. Right. Let's first talk about the guts of the form, and then we'll talk about the accessibility and the layout and the styling. First of all, form tag. Get's going to send the information as part of the URL, and that's typically what we're going to use in this class. Post sends the information but does not include it on the URL. And if I were to put post in here, you notice when I click the submit button, I don't see my query up in the URL. Notice I don't see it up there. And of course it doesn't work because the Bing search engine is expecting it to be in the URL. So I say get and we'll be back in business. So get puts it on the URL, post doesn't. It sends it a different way. And again, you have to match up what your server is expecting. And if you're doing this in an actual project, you'll be writing both halves of it. You'll be writing this code and you'll be writing the server code or someone else on your team will be writing the server code. All right, so you have to agree. So we have to use get in this case. App is the URL that is called. It's the name of the server-side script. And we can get that in this case by looking at the results and picking everything before the question mark. Input, type equals text, means it's a plain text box. Name equals Q. Q is what it expects on the server to that to be called, so that has to match it. Uh, ID equals Q, that's for something else. Then finally, a submit button is what goes and sends it to the server. Now for styling and for accessibility, we put each thing in a LI in an unordered list. And then for every text box and so on, we are going to have a label tag. And with the label tag, you use the ID to match things up. So this label belongs to the thing that has this ID. OK. So that's text boxes. Let's look at your assignment or part of your assignment. Because it's actually a two-part assignment this week.
you'll create a form to submit data to a server-side script that I've written. Your form will contain field, name of field, and possible values. Here's the script that I'm going to use. CISS web, Lorraine CCC.edu, user uploads, M. Zeller, CISS 216 lab.php. So, what will that be in your form? It'll be the action, because that's what you want to call. What will you use for the method? Use get. All right? Now, let's look at these things. Name, it's going to be a text box, right? What are we going to call the name of that field? It's FRM name. So that will be the name attribute. The label should say name. The label should say foam and so on. So on. These are all the names of the fields that you are going to have in the input tag. Now, that's all well and good until we get to size. Size, we want to call FRM size, but a text box allows people to put anything they want to in there. This, however, says that there's only three values, S, M, and L, small, medium, and large. Likewise, type, type of crust, one for thin, two for thick, three for stuffed. Pepperoni should have a yes, a Y for yes. Mushrooms, extra cheese, delivery. And extra instructions. Now, could you imagine if extra instructions are long? That like, well, park in the driveway, go up to the door, remember to knock hard, and so on. All right, you're liable to have a, a few sentences that explain what, what to do. Ordinary text boxes aren't going to work well for these things because the only valid choices for size are S, M, and L. All right. If I make a text box, users can put anything they want to in that text box. All right. But we only serve small, medium, and large pizzas. So we want to make sure that when they order a pizza, they put in a proper value for that. We can't do that with a text box. All right. Are there other things that you've seen on the form other than a text box that allows people to enter data? You want anything else on a form that allows you to enter data, but is not a text box? Well, let's see if we can find a form. Let's go and sign up for an Amazon account. like that. Let's try something else. Let's try signing in for an eBay account. Uh. All right, here's the example of it. Notice that you can either have a personal account or business account. You choose between those two options. It has to be one or the other. There's not a text box that allows you to type in personal or business. There's instead these buttons, and these buttons are called radio buttons. Let's Look for one other thing.
trying to find where you go in to search for classes. And I don't want to log on. It's going to make me log on. So you can't search for classes unless you're logged on. Hmm. Let's try this. Ah, here we go. Notice up here on the form, Cleveland, for sale, musical instruments. These are not text boxes, right? Why, isn't, why are these not text boxes? Why are these drop-down boxes instead of text boxes? Because you can't put just anything in. Right? There's only certain places that there's Craigslist, Craigslist for. All right? And here's a list of them in this area. There's only a certain number of things that you can do. Community, events for sale, gigs, housing, and so on. There's not an unlimited number of things that you can do. There's a certain predefined list of things that you can do. And likewise, if you're going to buy something, there's a list of things that you can buy. But you can't just type anything in there. This is another way of putting stuff uh, into a form, is by limiting the options. So small, medium, and large for your pizza examples like that. You can't put in huge, or gigantic, or tiny or anything like that. You have to put in one of those choices, S, M, or L. Now, I'm not going to give the user a text box, because if I give the user a text box, they could type anything in they wanted to. And it might not be something that we have. So instead, I'm going to use a technique that allows us to limit the choices the user can make. And that is, there's, there's two things that allow us to do that. One of them is what's called a drop-down box, and the other is what's called radio buttons. And a drop-down box looks like this. It shows you a list of your options. And when you pick one, then that's the one that you select. So you click on the button, you see a list of your options, and then that's the one you get. The other option is what's called a radio button. And that is where you have a list of buttons, and they're such that if you pick one, it turns the other buttons off. It's like the radio buttons in your car. So, let's look for a second, and let's see what we can add, maybe a drop-down to Bing. Here's an example of a drop-down. In Bing settings, there is a language on how you want things displayed. So let's say we want French displayed.
All right, it changes it to French. French. We we get share. Or we can choose another language. We can choose English. All right, so let's make a specialized search engine just for this page, just for this class, where we can allow the people to, to you can choose either um, HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. So we're going to limit to what you can search. Now, again, is this practical? I don't know. There might be a case where you might want to limit what people can search. So. I'm going to go and I'm going to make a second copy of the form. And I'm going to do the same search, except I'm going to do it with a drop-down box. And with the drop-down box, again, remember that it's going to limit to what they can choose. So how do you do a drop-down? Do a drop-down like this. It's not an input tag. It's a select tag. It still has a name of Q. It then has underneath or, or within the select tag, it has a series of options. And each option has a value, and it also has the text that is going to be displayed. So let me copy this a couple times and let me do a couple other options that we can select for. So let's do CSS and we'll pick cascading. So I created a second form on this page. Normally you wouldn't have two forms on the page. I'm just doing this for, to, to illustrate this. So I'll go and I'll save this. And let me go and bring this up. Let's look at the second drop down. Notice what this, with the search, with the drop down for the search. What displays in here? The stuff that's between the start and end option tag. So that should be what people are going to understand. So for example, if you're able to do a search for professor, I may have a professor ID number. In fact, I do have a professor ID number. But you don't know what it is. All right. So it shouldn't have the professor ID numbers displayed. It should have the name, because you should know the name that you want to search for the professor. So it would have the name of the professor here and it would have the value of the professor's ID number there. So this is what, in, within the start and end option tag, is what people understand. All right? 
And the value then is going to be what the computer needs, what the script needs to do its job. So I'm saying hypertext markup language. I'm displaying that to the, uh, to the people. I'm displaying cascading style sheets to people. I'm displaying JavaScript. However, the script behind the scenes needs these things. So in your case, with sizes, small, medium, and large, you should write out the word small between the option, medium, and large, and the value then should be what the script needs, which is either S, M, or L. All right? And you shouldn't use a text box for this because you don't want people typing in just any old thing. You want people to select one of those options. So, now if I go in and pick that I want to do cascading style sheets and go, it goes and performs that search. So, use a text box where the user can type pretty much anything in, where it's freeform text. For name, for example, you know, there's not a list of names. Name could be anything. So, you'd use a text box for that. For things like size, for things like, um, um, what, I don't know, a size, a type of crust, uh, and so on, maybe delivery or, or pickup, maybe pepperoni, yes or no, you would use a drop-down box uh, for those things. Yes. All right. Now, another way that you can do this is through the use of what are called radio buttons. All right. Radio buttons um, serve a similar purpose, except they um, display all of them at the same time. What's what nice about the drop-down is that the drop-down shows you all the options only when you click on the little arrow. All right? Otherwise, it just shows you your selected option. Whereas a radio button shows you all the options all the time. Um, therefore, if you had a, a, something that had a whole bunch of options, you'd probably want to use a drop-down because you don't want it to take up that much space. If you had something that only had a few options, you might use a drop down, you might use a radio button. So let's go to wrap things up today. Let's go and do this search using a radio button. Good idea. So I'm going to make a third version of this search that uses a radio button. Radio buttons work like this. Input type equals radio. Value equals, and again, this is whatever you want the script to see. So I'll do HTML. Name equals, in this case, it's going to be Q. Why? Well, it's, that's the name that we have to send to the server. Now again, I need to put the label tags in to associate these labels with the input. 
And so I have to give each of these an ID. The name I keep the same. The name is what makes it a radio button. And what is it, it is what ties the two things, it ties the three buttons together. The ID is going to be used for the label. So notice we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So I can select that. Notice that as I select one, the other ones are turned off. And I can click go, and then there's my search on HTML, or I could pick CSS and go, and there's my search with that. What makes them work like a radio button is the fact that they all have the same name. They do all have different IDs because, again, everything on the page should have its own unique ID. You can't have duplicate IDs, and the label uses the ID to say what it's associated with. So you sort of have two options if you have a finite number of selections. You can use a radio button, or you can use a drop-down. Now, you, not, you want to use a radio button if there's only one option, like yes. You know, where you click it, it means yes. If you wanted to represent yes or no with a radio button, you'd have a yes button and a no button. All right, because remember, once you click on a radio button, one of them is going to stay clicked. And if there's only one, then you can't click off of it to choose another one. All right, we have a, a bit more to do with forms. We're going to construct a different form next time uh, that's going to take advantage of some of the uh, some of the, these new things that we, uh, some of the uh, other form controls that we have not covered yet, uh, as, as well as the form controls that we uh, uh, have covered today. So we will do that next time, talk a little bit more about styling, and, uh, and then go from there. Um, the last thing we'll talk about as far as forms go is, are there some uh, new form controls in HTML5 that uh, are really neat and allow you to do more? Um, than just have a plain old text box. So we'll cover that next time. Are there any questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab. All right.